Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I should say I'm Gerard Venema, one of the uh, organizers of the workshop series, but I'm one of the ones who had who did none of the work for the current uh, workshop. But anyway, welcome back to this uh, final session for the afternoon. Um, our first speaker is Tom Needham from Florida State University, and he's going to speak on decorated merged trees for persistent topology. All right, great, thanks a lot. Um, thanks everybody for uh, coming to the session. Very happy to speak here. Um, yeah, so this is all joint work with uh, Justin Curry, Haibin Hong, Washington Mio, and Osman Akutan. Um, and so, so this is in the field of topological data analysis. Um, so let me start with some motivation. Uh, so so the, the overarching idea is to try to cook up um, new sort of topological signatures for data uh, that go a little bit beyond the persistence diagrams and barcodes that we've been seeing um, the last couple of days. Uh, so here's some motivation. Um, suppose we have a couple of topological spaces uh, endowed with some functions. Let's say that they're height functions in this picture. Um, so I have, I have X and Y, and then I'm projecting onto the kind of Z axis here with my function. Um, so TDA, topological data analysis, one way you can think of it is it's uh, sort of about understanding the shape of um, filtered, like, like filtered topology, right? So I can think about, for example, the sublevel set um, of each of these functions, and I can think about, um, you know, pick, pick a height, look at everything underneath that height, and look at the topology, and then look at uh, how the topology changes as I increase my threshold value for each of these spaces. Um, now that these are kind of adversarial examples uh, because the topological signatures you get by doing that for these spaces are gonna be the same um, in degree zero and degree one. Uh, so here, these are barcodes. Um, we, we've been seeing more, I guess, persistence diagrams, um, but this is just tracking the, the life of homological features in each dimension as I um, move up the filtration. Okay, so I, I see that uh, by construction, um, these things have the kind of same filter topology, even though I would say that uh, they, they should be different from the filter topology perspective um, because they, they really are sort of different spaces from the perspective of the z-axis here. Uh, so the idea is to try to refine this sort of invariant a bit to be able to, to distinguish um, these two spaces with their height functions from the perspective of filtered topology. <clears throat> okay, so uh, how are we going to do that? Um, so the barcode uh, records this filter topology. Uh, you can think of it as a, a parameterized family of vector spaces, and this has come up in the uh, keynote lectures. So I can think of this barcode, so say we have the degree one barcode, um, which tracks the life of degree one homological features. Moving left to right now, I've, I've turned uh, the picture on its side. Um, so at each parameter value, I'm getting a vector space. Okay, and I can uh, at least say what the dimension of each vector space is just by counting the number of bars that I intersect um, in each slice here. Okay, so it's a zero dimensional vector space to the left of the, this first berth. Um, and then as I move to the right, I'm, I'm getting different vector spaces. And beyond that, it's actually not just the vector spaces, but I'm getting linear maps um, between the vector spaces at each time. Uh, and then th this is what, uh, this came up in the, the lecture this morning. This is what's called a, a persistence module. So it's this um, parameterized family of vector spaces. Uh, and it, th these two notions are equivalent under certain reasonable assumptions. Um, so uh, uh, a way to think about what really is this persistence module is I can think about it kind of in a categorical framework. Um, so I can think of the persistence module as a functor from R into vect where I'm thinking of the real numbers as a category, um, thinking of it as a post-set category. So the objects are just numbers. I have a morphism um, between two numbers, if and only if uh, one is less than the other. Um, so just abstract, I can think of it as a category in this way, then this is a functor, um, which is to say that, you know, I'm getting, uh, for, for every less than here, I'm getting a linear map between the corresponding vector spaces and everything kind of is cohesive in the right way. Um, okay, so if you think about it uh, from this categorical perspective, then there are ways that you can think of to generalize this. Um, 
So Peter Bubinak and uh, De Silva and Scott uh, introduced this idea of generalizing this by thinking of um, kind of the source category as say an arbitrary poset category. Uh, and then the target category could be really any category you want on the right hand side. Let's just stick with uh, the category vector spaces um, as my target category. Uh, so so th this is kind of a generalized persistence module and you could uh, say, well, you know, what, what sort of generalized persistence modules would be interesting from this filtered topology perspective. And um, the idea is that there are certain posets uh, associated to a sublevel set filtration, which are geometrically interesting. Um, a couple examples would be the rave graph or the merge tree associated to the uh, space and the function. Um, so, so these are common things in, in TDA and, and elsewhere, but if you haven't seen these, it's a pretty simple idea. So I take my space, which has been endowed with some function, and I create a quotient space called the rave graph. Um, and what the, the equivalence relation is I say that uh, two points are equivalent if they lie on the same connected component of the level set at that height, okay? So here I have two components of, of that level set, so I get two uh, equivalence classes. Whereas if I have a single connected component, I get a single equivalence class. Um, so the, the space at, or the, the ray graph is just X modded out by that equivalence relation. And this picks up um, certain topological features of uh, the space, the kind of filtered topological features. Um, a slightly simpler invariant is the merge tree, which is also a quotient. But here I'm going to um, say that two points are equivalent if they lie in the same connected component of the sublevel set, okay? So since um, I can get from this point to that point by going down, um, these two points get identified. So I'm kind of crushing out the, the extra degree one structure here. Um, and typically you would think of the merge tree as going off to infinity. Um, so this is, the merge tree is kind of a simpler invariant than the rave graph, uh, and it's really tracking more just the, the degree zero uh, homology as I filter up through the, the function values. Um, so we're, we're gonna focus on merge trees because, uh, so both, either one of these gives you a poset um, just by saying, okay, a point here is less than a point here if there's an increasing path going from one to the other. Um, same thing in the merge tree. Uh, but the merge tree has some extra structure, which is useful. Um, it has a structure similar to the real line, which is that uh, I know how to sh shift upwards in a well-defined way. So given a point and given some epsilon, there's a unique point that's um, you know epsilon height above where I started, which is not the case for the ray graph. If I start here and my epsilon is like that distance, then I don't know which way to go. Um, so that extra structure being able to shift allows you to uh, define generalized versions of interleaving distance, um, such as you know, the interleaving distance that, that came up in this morning's lecture uh, can be extended to kind of post sets with which have this kind of shifting structure. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so that that is uh, where we're going to define our, our new invariant. Um, so the decorated merge tree is a functor from a merge tree to a, uh, the, the category vector spaces. Right, so it's very similar to a persistence module. I'm just replacing real numbers with a um, fixed merge tree. Uh, so the, the, the main motivating example we should keep in mind here um, is that where do I get, get a decorated merge tree? It's when I have a space with some function, real value function defined on it, um, then what is the value of this functor at a point? Well, I'm going to say, uh, same at this point, I look at the, um, say, kth homology of the sublevel set or the component of that sublevel set containing um, the equivalence class at this point. Okay, so so to this point, I would associate uh, R say. Um, <clears throat> so so that's the the kind of example that I have in mind is, is I'm going to associate a homology of that component at each point in the merge tree. Um, I'll make a couple of remarks just because this stuff will come up a bit later. Uh, we can also define this as a functor from, from R, but we change the target category to something called parameterized vector spaces. 
Um, so that this, this fits into the uh, Bubinic de Silva Scott framework um, pretty naturally. If we think about it this way, I mean, these are equivalent definitions. Um, and okay, so, so the, the example you have in mind is sublevel set filtrations of function or of uh, functions on topological spaces. This can be defined a lot more generally. So it doesn't have to be specifically coming from that. Um, but that's kind of like the thing to have in the back of your head. Okay, so let's go back to our motivating example. Uh, we have two spaces with their height functions. They have the same barcodes in degree zero and degree one. But if I construct their uh, decorated merge trees, then I see that um, the decorated merge trees distinguish uh, these examples, right? Because the decorated merge tree is not just recording the, the uh, connected component and degree one homology information separately, it's recording kind of where the degree one um, homology lives. And specifically in this example where it's born, um, right? So, so, so this is a richer invariant than uh, collections of barcodes uh, because it's, uh, you know, involving the, the kind of relationships between degrees. Um, okay, and th so this is uh, various tools can actually be implemented for dealing with decorated merge trees. So here's some uh, computational examples of how this looks. Um, another benefit of using merge trees over, say, rave graphs is that uh, if I use a, if I look at a Viator's rips complex of a point cloud, then the associated merge tree is a, a classical thing in data science called a, a, a hierarchical clustering dendrogram. So it's easy to produce merge trees um, in this kind of point cloud setting. So he, here would be the the merge tree for this um, particular point cloud. Uh, which is telling you how, you know, remember that the Vitor Serps complex is just growing a little metric ball around each point. And then um, using that to construct some partial complexes at various scales. So this is telling you how the, uh, the points kind of merge as I increase the radii of these metric balls. And then the decorations here are telling you um, where do the degree one homological features live? And this is telling you that uh, there are two loops in one of the components, um, you know, in a multi-scale way, and there's a single loop in this component. Um, so here, here's another kind of adversarial example. So here are two different point clouds. If I look at uh, the degree zero and degree one persistence diagrams, then these are, um, essentially the same, you know, up to sampling errors, you would not be able to, to distinguish these as being different spaces. Eyeballing these, these seem to have different topology and uh, the difference in topology is reflected in these decorated merge trees. Once again, by kind of uh, fusing the degree one and the degree zero information into a single invariant. Um, so just a couple more examples. You can uh, decorate the merge tree with uh, various dimensions of homological information. So this picture is kind of uh, giving you a full summary of this point cloud with the Viator's rips filtration. Um, the decorated merge tree allows you to uh, figure out which component a cycle was born on in a, in a very straightforward way. So I look for the birth time of a bar, trace down to all the points below it in the merge tree, and then that, that blue cycle corresponds to the outer ring here. It's very straightforward to determine that. Um, you can do this, you know, it's a very flexible sort of thing. So here I'm starting with a network. I'm putting some filtration on the nodes. Uh, this is in particular a diffusion for Shea function, which is something like a density. Um, and then uh, creating a filtered topological space out of that and um, producing a decorated merge tree. Um, which is picking up in the, the merge tree part of this is picking up kind of regions of density and the, the decorations are picking up cycles. Um, or, you know, then I can think of an, uh, say a grayscale image as a network itself with some filtration over it. And then, so these are uh, glioblastoma multiform tumor segmentations. I can um, extract these kind of topological representations of what's going on here. Um, okay, so, so let, let me say something about uh, metrics on decorated merge trees. Uh, th there are various metrics you could use to distinguish two decorated merge trees. Um, so here's kind of one of the main theorems of the paper. Uh, there's a lot going on here. So let's suppose that I have continuous maps on topological spaces, X and Y. Um, then there are various kind of uh, topological signatures I could extract from that information. 
could extract the merge trees, MF and MG. I could extract the sublevel set barcodes uh, for degree zero or degree K bigger than zero. Or I could um, extract the decorated merge trees as we've been discussing here. And then I have this big hierarchy uh, of distances, which I will uh, explain. Um, OK, so, so the D sub Bs are uh, bottleneck distance or, or Wasserstein distance, um, Wasserstein infinity distance, to be precise, uh, as we've been discussing in the morning sessions. Um, so the, these are just, uh, if I think about the persistence diagrams, these are these uh, trying to find matchings between points in the persistence diagrams. Um, so these are the absolute lower, uh, lowest lower bounds uh, in, in this hierarchy. So this is saying that the bottleneck distance is kind of like the least discriminative thing um, if you're looking at this uh, comparing filter topology. Uh, the most discriminative thing is uh, something called the homotopy type distance um, uh, for Sunni, Landy, and uh, Mainly. Uh, that's pretty complicated. So this is just defined um, on the spaces and function pairs themselves. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how this is defined. Uh, it's, a, in fact, infinity if x and y are not homotopy equivalent. So it's kind of this very coarse uh, notion of distance, but that, that's kind of the absolute upper bound. Um, the stuff in the middle deals with merge trees. Um, so this is the interleaving distance between merge trees uh, of Morozov et al. Um, the idea here is, given two merge trees, how do I measure the distance between them? I try to look for kind of maps that bounce back and forth, which um, are continuous and preserve the poset structure uh, and also preserve height up to some epsilon. So I'm allowed to boost up by some epsilon. And then I look for the minimum such epsilon um, where I can find these back and forth maps. And that, that minimum epsilon would be the interleaving distance. Um, so, so the interleaving distance is, is more sensitive than the bottleneck distance in degree zero. Um, <clears throat> Here is, so this is a distance between decorated merge trees. This is the generalized interleaving distance of uh, Bubinick, De Silva, and Scott. Uh, if I think of the decorated merge trees as functors from R into per, uh, parametrized vector spaces, um, this is kind of just a, a general thing that exists. Uh, the issue is it's not really clear how to compute this. So, so this is like kind of optimal in a way. It's, it's uh, more sensitive than bottleneck distance or interleaving distance, um, but not as rigid as this homotopy type distance. Uh, but computability is unclear there. Uh, so the thing we'll actually work with in applications is something we call the matching distance. Um, and this is something we can approximate using tools from optimal transport theory, in particular, uh, Gromov Wasserstein distance of uh, Mamoli. So, this is a, a distance between metric measure spaces, similar to Gromov Hausdorff distance between metric spaces, and a, uh, a variant of that due to Bayer et al. Um, very recently. Um, running a bit low on time, so I won't go into details of this, but there are, are ways to, to compute, uh, approximate this at least computationally. Um, so, here, here's an example of that in action. Uh, so, here are six kind of classes of point clouds, which are all kind of adversarially topologically similar, but not the same. Um, so I'll, I'll generate three random instances from each class, just in this toy example. Um, so, so the randomness is that these are being sampled from some distribution. Um, and then I can uh, compute various distances between instances of these uh, random, random draws of the, from these classes using various TDA type signatures um, so I could look at the bottleneck distance between degree zero barcodes or degree one barcodes or some sort of combination of those or this kind of matching distance that um, I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, and we see that, so, so this is the distance between the, the decorated merge trees is the point here. And we see that um, degree zero and degree one bottleneck distance are very much confusing the classes with one another, kind of, kind of by design. This is an adversarial example. Uh, whereas the decorated merge trees um, distinguish the classes very well. So these are just the distance matrices and here are some uh, multi-dimensional scaling plots and the, the clusters are, are very well defined here. Um, as one more example, uh, a, a classical task is to say, okay, given two networks, I wanna find a correspondence between nodes, which um, reflects similarities in the graphs as much as possible. Um, and so there are all sorts of al algorithms to do such things. This is called graph alignment. Uh, 
So here is an attempt to align this graph on the left with the graph on the right um, using some more classical methods. Uh, this is being visualized by picking some coloration of the source graph and then transferring that to the target graphs um, according to whatever matching I produce. And we see that these do you know, pretty well in reflecting features, but are kind of mixing stuff up a bit. So blue stuff is going from this cluster to here, say, um, or this has some red mixed in. Uh, because the, the method we're using to compute the matching distance for decorated merge trees is based on these kind of optimal transport notions, part of it involves computing correspondences. So um, then when you do so, the correspondences are informed by the global topology. And we see that uh, the, the node correspondence between these networks is um, kind of much more reflective of the large scale features and I'm not really mixing stuff from different features here. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I should end here. Uh, so here's uh, the paper that's on archive now. Um, here's some open source code to play around with this. Uh, and I will uh, stop there and say, thanks for listening. All right, let's thank our speaker. Are there, are there, are there any questions? Maybe I should ask that first. Are there questions uh, that anyone wants to ask? I, I have a question. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure either that it's that relevant or that I know what I'm talking about, but I, I know that one thing that kind of comes up, and I think Peter mentioned this the other day, when you want to analyze things like uh, the persistence barcodes uh, in the ordinary case is that you've got these nice decomposition theorems that tell you that, um, you know, it's sort of quiver algebra, but that, you know, as long as you're along a line, everything decomposes into just these, these nice intervals. So when you're doing things on trees and don't necessarily have those theorems, or, or maybe you do, um, does, in what ways does that complicate the analysis? Yeah, great question. Completely relevant question. Um, yeah, so, so we go into this in the paper. So things become uh, a lot wilder once you go to trees and there's no general decomposition theorem. Um, so we have some sufficient conditions to be able to do some sort of decomposition in the paper, but they're, they're fairly weak, I would say, um, which is why the, the computational techniques we use are a lot different than what's used for standard uh, persistence diagrams. Um, and really the, 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 the kind of computational bottleneck in dealing with this is given two decorated merge trees, I first need to align the tree structures to say anything. Um, and so that, that itself is like a graph matching problem, which is why like these tools about graph matching were already you know, on our minds. Um, yeah, so, so it's computationally uh, a lot trickier and even when we compute the distance, it's only guaranteed to be an approximation because we're doing some kind of optimization tricks to do this. Um, yeah, but, but the, the, the representation theory aspect of this is very interesting and rich. And I, I think that there's not really any hope that you can get a completely general thing, but in certain, um, certain circumstances, you can prove things. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? No, well, let's try again to thank our speaker. I'll clap. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and so there'll be one more talk at uh, 